God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations, I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let us worship the Lord our God this day. Welcome to this time of worship with the St. Andrew's Church community, and thank you for taking the time to join us in this online service. Just a few brief announcements as we begin today. Bob Ferris is on some holidays for the month of August, but will be back with us for a few weeks in September as he prepares for his retirement this fall. On Sunday, September the 17th, Bob will have his last sort of official service with us, and that will include the Sacrament of Communion. And following the service that day, will, there will be a congregational barbecue to which everyone is welcome and encouraged to attend. So please do make an effort to be with us on Sunday, September the 17th, as we celebrate Bob's presence and ministry among us and wish him the best wishes in his, this uh, new chapter of his life in retirement. Our reader today is Daniel Hoogstein. Daniel is the newly hired Faith Formation Coordinator for Children and Youth here at the church. Daniel comes with a lot of experience in camping ministries in our church, and many of the members of his extended family are, are, have been very involved in the Presbyterian Church in Canada throughout their lives. So we do welcome Daniel, and we look forward to working with him as he provides leadership and guidance in the youth and children's ministries of our congregation. There's a number of other activities um, that are happening in the life and work of the church as this fall season starts in a couple of months. So you're welcome to visit the church website at www.standrewstoronto.org to find out more. But for now, we we'll just invite you to relax and breathe deeply and prepare to worship the living God this day. Gracious and holy God, Words fail us when we seek to name you, to describe you, to contemplate you, to speak of you. So fill us instead with your spirit and touch us with your grace. As we enter into this time of contemplation and prayer and worship, remind us of your presence and your goodness and your grace. Renew right spirits and clean, create clean hearts within us so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth and be ever more fully conformed to the image and likeness of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Forgive us for our sins, O God. Help us to change broken ways and allow us to live towards the abundance of life that you intend for each one of your beloved children. We offer these prayers and this time of worship to you in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he, was rest as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to the man, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he faced Pen Penuel, limping because of his hip. Here ends our first reading. Today's psalm is selected verses from Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our next reading comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Here ends our gospel reading. A few weeks ago during our summer break, my wife Leslie and I spent a couple of hours one afternoon cleaning out an old storage locker in the basement of our building. Amongst the treasures in that storage locker was a box of old report cards and certificates and essays and, and photographs from my days in grade school and high school as a teenager in the 1980s. Kate and Madeline and Spencer, who are now the age that I was in the 1980s, 
both laughed and groaned when we showed them some of the pictures of the clothes and particularly the 1980s hairstyles, mullet included, that adorned we who were teenagers in that decade. The kids encouraged me to accept that the mullet, at least on me, is a, is a hairstyle best consigned to the dustbin of history. As I dug through that treasure trove of memories, I found myself somewhat shocked to realize that the year 1980, the beginning of that decade, was 43 years ago. That to me kind of blew my mind. 1980 was 43 years ago. But in spite of the long gap of time since that decade, there seems to be something of a resurgence of 1980s-based cultural activities happening these days. This past week in Toronto, for example, there was a triple bill of Boy George and the Culture Club, Howard Jones and Berlin at the Budweiser stage venue out at the old Ontario place, all of which came to fame in the 1980s. In the coming week, our city will host a concert by Lionel Richie, who, though he first came to popular attention in the 1970s, had his biggest hits in the 1980s. Hello, is it me you're looking for? I'm not going to sing that, nor will I sing any of the Duran Duran hits that were released in that decade and that they will likely be playing since they are back on tour this year. Indiana Jones, to whom we were all first introduced in the early 1980s, is back in the movie theaters this year. And just last year, Tom Cruise is back in the air in the sequel to 1986's Top Gun. Perhaps in large part due to the popularity of the television show Stranger Things, which was set in the 1980s, a whole new generation of kids has been introduced to Kate Bush and Metallica and all manner of other strange things that crept out of that decade. All of which is to say that it seems only a matter of time before the mullet is on its way back. But all the strange cultural phenomena of that often strange decade well, one of the weirdest was the rise of professional wrestling. And even those who were not particularly dedicated fans of wrestling came to know the names of some of the central characters. Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Jesse the Body Ventura, who went on to become the elected governor of Minnesota, to name only a few. And those 1980s wrestlers paved the way for a younger generation of wrestlers to become some of the biggest movie stars in the world today. John Cena, David Bautista, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, they were all wrestlers first. You get the point. What was strange then has now become quite popular and quite common today. Now, I mention all this not out of some desire to encourage anyone to spend much time following professional wrestling nor to try to spark nostalgia for the 1980s. Rather, I mention it because what the promoters of wrestling came to realize in the 1980s was that they could use the metaphor of a wrestling match to tell stories about characters that could build a massive audience to the point where stadiums by the end of the 1980s were packed to the, the rafters in order to witness grand productions with titles such as WrestleMania and Raw. Wrestling matches not only became multi-million dollar extravaganzas, but a vehicle to dramatize enduring human themes, the triumph of the underdog, who to cheer for in the cartoonishly staged conflict between good and evil, whether to cheer if a supposedly good guy acted deceitfully, and what to do when a bad guy did something good. Aside from the bombastic nature of the productions and the characters that populated them, there was an intriguing parallel between them and the ancient tradition of morality plays. People gathering together to tell stories, to explore themes and morals in dramatic form. As strange as it may seem, by the early 1990s, academic papers were starting to be written with titles such as, and I quote, Professional Wrestling, Moral Commentary Through Ritual Metaphor. And just last year, I happened to hear an extended radio documentary on the CBC radio show Ideas about the rise of professional wrestling in the 1980s and the intriguing overlap between professional wrestling and contemporary philosophy. Stranger things, it seems, 
did not end in the 1980s. But neither were they new to the 1980s. For millennia, wrestling matches have been used as a metaphor to present deep messages and meaning about life. A reading from Genesis 32 today tells a story in which a dramatic wrestling match is used to explore great philosophical and theological themes. And the passage is best pondered in that light, not as a straightforward, objective, literalistic description of a, a tussle between two contenders, but rather as a narrative steeped in metaphor and ambiguity and mystery. In one corner, as an announcer might say, we have Jacob. Jacob, the second son of Isaac and the conniving little brother of his twin Esau, who from the moment that the two were born was already trying to scheme his way into a better position than his older brother, grabbing Esau's heel in utero, tricking him out of the family birthright, deceiving their father so that Jacob, the younger, would get the paternal blessing that was rightfully due to Esau, the older brother. Jacob is again and again presented in an unflattering light. Successful? Often. Unethical? Usually. And it did not always go well for Jacob. In fact, by the time that today's narrative begins, Jacob has been estranged from his family and exiled from his homeland for a significant period of time. He'd labored for years in the employ of a distant relative named Laban and had grown older and married and had children. Now, Jacob had been told by God that it was time to return to his ancestral home. But that journey home was not without complexity including the fact that he learned that his brother Esau, upon learning that J Jacob was returning, had amassed a force of 400 men to meet him. The nature of the welcome that he could anticipate was ambiguous at best. And so, on the banks of the Jabbok River, beset by fears, unsure of whether he would the next day be facing a wonderful reunion with an estranged brother or a violent encounter rooted in a decades-old familial conflict, Jacob entered into a dark night of wrestling with an unnamed, mysterious opponent. Although his adversary is described as a man, very little description is offered in this text. Was it some form of ancient folkloric knight troll who could not face the light of day, like, might one, like one might find in the pages of Tolkien? Or was it some metaphysical being, an angel sent from God? Was the unarmed opponent some form of projection of Jacob's own fears and anxieties, or a metaphorical manifestation of his brother Esau? Was it God in some unrecognizable form? Each of these suggestions has been made by interpreters and commentators over the centuries, and each one of them offers rich opportunities for reflection on the metaphorical and psychological and spiritual meaning of this story. Clearly, this story invites us into the realm of metaphor and ambiguity and mystery so that we might discover its meaning. And Jacob had to wrestle with that strange being through the whole long, dark night. The wider story has already informed us that he was in a time of uncertainty and stress and ambiguity, that he did not know how to move forward or how to move backward, but he did not run away from the wrestling either. And that is perhaps where we begin to be offered inspiration in this story of the wrestling match that Jacob was involved in. Because unlike Jacob, most of us, when we find ourselves in the dark nights of our lives, well, we want to do whatever we can do to get away from them. We don't want to stick around and wrestle in those difficult moments. We want to escape from whatever is filling us with fear and anxiety and uncertainty and ambiguity and grief and pain and mystery and threat. We don't want to be anywhere around them. And what's even more strange is that we learn that Jacob does not let go of that unnamed adversary because he is certain that if he holds on long enough, that which he was wrestling with would have to bestow a blessing upon him. And he was right. That night of wrestling changes his life. It redefines him in profound and historic ways. He's defined physically by it, Though the metaphorical through the medical through the metaphorical device of having his hip socket touched and displaced, 
From then on, Jacob would walk with a limp, every bit as much as anyone who has gone through a dark night of pain or grief or heartbreak or stress will be able to tell you, you limp a little bit afterwards. Yes, the light of a new day dawns, a new chapter of life begins, but like Jacob, one walks through life a little bit differently from then on. But that was not the most significant change that happened to our character because of his night of wrestling. Rather, Jacob's name is changed as well. He had been known as Jacob, which was related to the Hebrew word for heel, largely due to Jacob's grasping at Esau's heel when the twins were in their mother's womb. But the name had also had the connotation of a supplanter, or a usurper, or one who overreached. And that name had reflected his character in so many of the stories. He was the grasper, the usurper, the supplanter, the heel. But then he wrestled through the night. He struggled with that which filled him with fear, and he would not let go until that seemingly frightening adversary blessed him. And the blessing that came from then on was this, that his name would be Israel. For, as the mysterious stranger stated, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. It's fascinating for us to realize that this story of Jacob's night of wrestling has become one of the dominant metaphors for what it means to have a biblical faith. Consider, after all, what it means to be a people of the faith of Israel, of Jacob, on the basis of this story. It means having faith that invites us and calls us to cultivate the courage and the tenacity to wrestle even in the depths of our darkest nights and not to let go of the mysterious God who will not let go of us. It was that same example of courageous, tenacious, faithful wrestling It was actually played out so often in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Because for like Jacob and like Israel, Jesus wrestled. He wrestled with temptation in the wilderness. He wrestled with anguish and stress in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wrestled with pain and humiliation as he was led to the cross. He wrestled with a sense of God-forsaken despair after he had been nailed to it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he, like Jacob, like Israel, also prevailed. His wrestling was not in vain, and that example now stands at the very heart of our faith. When the night is dark, don't let go. Turn to him and trust in him and hold on to him when fear and anxiety and uncertainty seem overwhelming and the future is unclear and hope seems lost. Hold on to him as Jacob clung to his mysterious opponent, and he came away blessed. It was in the dark night that God was revealed to Jacob. It was more than just a wrestling match. Then, it's more than just a wrestling match now. It was this story and this example of faith that also inspired the hymn writer Charles Wesley to write the words of a beautiful hymn entitled, Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown. I will leave you today with the first and last verses of that profound and beautiful hymn. Charles Wesley wrote, Come, O thou traveler unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. And then in its final verse, the hymn writer declares his realization of who it is that he has been wrestling with all along. Tis love, tis love thou diedst for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart, the morning breaks, the shadows flee, pure universal love thou art. To me, to all, thy mercies move, thy nature and thy name is love. To me, to all, thy mercies move, thy nature and thy name is love. Thanks be to God, and amen. Let us confess our faith today in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Living God, with hearts filled with gratitude for the blessings that you pour out so richly upon us, we approach you this day. Keep us ever mindful of your providence and your grace, that we might live with gratitude and respond with generosity. O God, in this time of prayer, keep us also mindful of the needs of others and of our own needs, and of your invitation to name our concerns and longings before you, for you are a God who hears and answers the prayers of your people. We pray, therefore, this day with confidence and with hope, in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who has called us to be his people, his church, his body in the world. We offer prayers for our world, for places of deprivation and disease, for situations of injustice and oppression, for lives shattered and broken by war and conflict, by abuse and exploitation, by despair. Help us and help the Church throughout the world to be a servant people, to use our gifts and skills and opportunities so that your will might be done and your purposes accomplished. We offer prayers for our loved ones and friends, for those who need to know your presence and your peace in their lives, for those suffering in sickness, in loneliness, in grief, in anxiety. In silence, we pray for others. We offer prayers for our own lives, for concerns and stresses that are sometimes only known to you, for circumstances that fill us with uncertainty and dread. In silence, O God, we pray for the needs that hang heavy upon our hearts. We offer prayers for the Church, giving thanks for the gift of community in Jesus Christ, and praying that your continued blessing and guidance might strengthen and inspire us. In silence, we name before you the needs and concerns of our communities of faith and for your Church in this world. O God, as this new week dawns upon us, help us in all that we do to love you more fully, to serve you more faithfully, to glorify you more sincerely, and to be the people that you have created us and called us to be. We offer these prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen.
And now may the love of Almighty God, the grace of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the comfort and friendship of God's Holy Spirit dwell with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.